Brooks, who teaches English at Madison High School, enjoyed her vacation during the holidays just as much as any other teacher. But as it drew to a close, she had a peculiar reaction. Although I felt that my vacation had done me a lot of good, now that it was over, I was keyed up and enthusiastic, simply raring to go. Raring to go on another two weeks' vacation. <laughs> Meanwhile, I went about the business of getting used to working again and spent the past week noticing conditions which hadn't seemed so deplorable during the hustle and bustle of holiday time at the school. I was telling my landlady, Mrs. Davis, about them while we were having breakfast Friday morning. Let me pour you a cup of this coffee, Connie. It's Rio de Janeiro style. I just got the recipe. Rio de Janeiro style? Yes. I mashed up a few Brazil nuts and mixed them with the coffee ground. <laughs> That's one reason why the blonde hair of a Brazilian is so outstanding. But, Mrs. Davis, very few Brazilians have blonde hair. That's another reason it's so outstanding. <laughs> But I'm afraid I've interrupted something you started to say to me, Connie. Oh, it wasn't very important. I had just said that I... I... really shouldn't do that. It's a habit I picked up from my brother, Victor. He's terribly absent-minded. I thought your sister Angela was the absent-minded one in the family. Angela? Yes, that's what you told me. What did I tell you? <laughs> that she was very absent-minded. Who? <laughs> your brother, Victor. Now, how did you know that? You never even met Victor. <laughs> but he is confused sometimes, poor dear. Why, you could be talking about something to Victor and he'd seem as interested as could be in the conversation. But then if you just looked away for a moment, it could be right in the middle of a sentence that... Yes, Mrs. Davis? Mrs. Davis? Yoo-hoo, Mrs. Davis! Oh, oh good morning, Connie. <laughs> I was just looking for the cat out in the kitchen. She hadn't touched her milk. What do you hear from Victor? Victor? Oh, my brother. Oh, he's fine, thank you, dear. He calls me quite regularly. My sister Angela's the one that worries me. She's the absent-minded member of the family. <laughs> but I keep feeling that I disrupted your train of thought. Did I, Connie? There's not a car left on the tracks but the caboose. <laughs> I was merely telling you, Mrs. Davis, that I never realized how bad conditions were at school until this cold spell set in. Why, my classroom is so drafty that half my pupils can't answer questions because their teeth are chattering. <laughs> that must be awful. Young people have such loud teeth. <laughs> yes, yeah, sometimes my room sounds like a dice game on a tin roof. <laughs> Have you talked to the principal about it? Not yet, but I'm going to today. He's just got to get the Board of Education to allot us a bigger budget for coal. Well, I wish you luck, dear. Is uh, Walter Denton picking you up this morning? Yes, Mrs. Davis. Oh, good. Connie, I'd like to apologize again for interrupting you before. As I say, I've been a little worried about my eccentric brother, Victor. Before you go, though... Yes? Goodbye, Connie. Goodbye, Mrs. Davis. <laughs> By the way, Mrs. Yes, Connie. Yes, Connie, I... Why, she's gone. Poor thing. She's been under a terrible strain lately. <laughs> I'm glad you picked me up early, Walter. I've got to stop in and see Mr. Conklin before my first class. Oh, golly, Miss Brooks, there must be some pleasanter way to start off a Friday morning for a perfectly nice English teacher. Yes, there must be. Oh, it isn't that I don't respect Mr. Conklin. It's just that, well, there's something about you, Miss Brooks, that, well, before the hallowed walls of our beloved Madison High heaves into view, I want you to know that... Just a minute, Walter. Would you mind taking that sentence again a little slower? <laughs> I merely exclaimed, before the hallowed walls of our beloved Madison High heaves into view... That's what I, I thought you exclaimed. <laughs> Anything wrong, Miss Brooks? Well, frankly, Walter, I'd hesitate to correct that sentence without stopping a teacher's college for a refresher course. But uh, <laughs> what do you mean by heaves into view? Well, every so often you read about a ship that hove into view, don't you? Yes. Well, hove must be the past tense, mustn't it? Heave, haved, hove, isn't it? <laughs> oh, of course not, Walter. Heave, heaved, haved, uh... Heave, What do you want me to know before Madison High heaves into view? 
that you command as much respect as Mr. Conklin, plus the admiration of the entire student body, and that your personal warmth and charm is only exceeded by your excellence in your chosen field of instruction. Ain't it the truth? <laughs> I don't want to seem unduly inquisitive, Walter, but to what do I owe this verbal plaque? Nothing. It's just a natural reaction, a completely spontaneous and unrehearsed. And what did you get from our sponsor when you were selected as a contestant? A pen and pencil set that's guaranteed... Oh, no, that's not fair. <laughs> no, I'm being completely sincere and have no ulterior motive whatsoever. Then thank you, Walter. No, that's okay. Miss Brooks? Yes? Would you do me a favor? If I say no, you'll take back the plaque. Hmm? <laughs> well, what is it? Well, it's a basketball team. As you know, I'm the new manager, so it's, it's up to me to see Mr. Conklin about getting some things that we need immediately. And? And it's up to you to see Mr. Conklin for me because I'm rarely up to seeing Mr. Conklin. It, what I mean is that we've just got to get some more trunks. Where are you going? <laughs> no, we're not going anywhere. <laughs> no, we need stuff for the guys to put on while they're playing. You see, right now, every time we send in a substitute, he has to take a blanket along with him and change trunks with a fellow he's replaced. <laughs> About ten pairs should do fine. Ten pairs? Why don't you just get a larger blanket? <laughs> oh, no, this is serious, Miss Brooks. Oh, another thing you've got to talk to Mr. Conklin about for me is the temperature in the gym. Now, it's so cold in there, a good humor man has to referee the game. <laughs> of course, I'm exaggerating, Miss Brooks. I know, Walter, but uh, A, just what do you want me to ask, Mr. Conklin? And B, why should it be me instead of you? Well, A, to requisition $100 worth of equipment for the basketball team from the school board, and B, because you're older and carry more weight. <laughs> See, if we were driving in my car, you'd be walking by now. Oh, well, you don't understand, Miss Brooks. I'm not trying to shirk my duties, but well, this is a legitimate beef. Uh, let me put it this way. In the stockyards, when they want the sheep to run a certain way, they don't send a little lamb out to guide them. They send an old goat. <laughs> I've seen it in the newsreels, I'm sure, where they... The goat and the... Le Gosh, I hope you're not mad, Miss Brooks. Oh, forget it, Walter. Why should I be mad? <laughs> then you'll do it? You'll ask Mr. Conklin for me? I'll do my best. Now, you'd better start putting on your brakes. My brakes? Yes, the hallowed walls are hiving into view. <laughs> Ladies, regardless of age, skin type, or previous beauty care, doctors prove you, too, may win a lovelier complexion with palm olive soap. But to win this lovelier complexion, the kind men admire and women envy, you must stop improper cleansing. Instead, use palm olive soap the way doctors advise. Remember, 36 doctors, leading skin specialists, advised 1,285 women, many with complexion problems, to use palm olive this way. Some have dry skin, some oily, some coarse-looking. Using palm olive soap alone, two out of three won lovelier complexions. Now, here's what the doctors advise. Wash your face with palm olive soap. Massaging for one minute with palm olive soft lather. This cleansing massage brings your skin palm olive's full beautifying effect. Rinse. Do this three times a day for 14 days. It's that simple. But doctors have proved this way using nothing but palm olive really works. So forget other beauty care. Use palm olive soap alone for a lovelier complexion. For loveliness all over, use big thrifty bath size palm olive in your tub or shower. Well, here we are at school, Miss Brooks. If you will kindly disembark, I'll find a place to park and then return for a joust with the forces of education. If I was a gambler, Walter, I'd bet on you to place. <laughs> oh, there's Harriet Conklin. I think I'll ask her what kind of a mood her father's in. Okay, Miss Brooks. I'll see you later. Just a minute, Harriet. I'd, I'd like to talk to you. Oh, hello, Miss Brooks. I'm glad we ran into each other. Same here. Harriet, did you have breakfast with your father this morning? Well, yes, I did. How was he? His temper, I mean. Oh, pretty good, Miss Brooks. Until Mother showed him some of the bills that had come in. Then what did he do? Nothing unusual. He just slammed down his paper, bit through his coffee cup, and left. <laughs> it could have been worse. Sure, he could have bitten your mother. 
that's one of the reasons I'm glad we ran into each other. Miss Brooks, did I ever tell you what an unending source of inspiration you are? Oh, I must end somewhere. <laughs> I mean it, Miss Brooks. You're more than just an excellent instructor of English. You're... You're... I'm the patsy who's going to face your father with one of your problems. Huh? <laughs> All this in psychic, too. How did you know I wanted you to talk to Daddy for me, Miss Brooks? Well, why should you be an exception, Harriet? What's your beef? A uh, complaint. <laughs> the domestic science room. It's like a deep freeze. That room, too? It's so cold that most of us wear gloves all during the class. Makes it very awkward, Miss Brooks, especially when we're trying to use the sewing machine. It sounds pretty bad. Bad? It's terrible. Yesterday, Bessie Snyder sewed five of her fingers together. <laughs> well, what's so terrible about that? Gives you an extra ladle for the cooking class. <laughs> it broke the sewing machine, and we need $200 for a new one. Oh, but Harriet... I... Miss Brooks, it's up to you to make conditions in this school livable. For you, you mean. I'd better be armed with plenty of facts before I face your father, though. I think I'll make a survey of the rest of the rooms. Starting with Mr. Boynton's biology laboratory... Now who's psychic? <laughs> yes, Harriet, I think I'll interview the shy master of the microbes. I've been in there, Miss Brooks. It's even colder than the other rooms. I hope you can do something about it. I should be able to, with the experience I've had. Well, what do you mean, Miss Brooks? I've been trying to thaw Mr. Boynton out for years. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Boynton. Oh, it's you, Miss Brooks. How do you feel this morning? Cold, thanks, especially in here. Where do you hang your sides of beef, Mr. Boynton? <laughs> oh, it... <laughs> this kind of silly at that. I was going to ask Mr. Cochran about the heating situation, but now that you're here, I wonder if you would... Uh... Naturally. <laughs> you better slip this coat on. Even your voice is shivery. <laughs> No, this outfit I'm wearing is fairly warm. I've got four sweaters on, you know. Really? Where? Let's not get racy, Mr. Boynton. <laughs> Sorry, Miss Brooks. I didn't mean anything personal. You never do. <laughs> oh, the situation is pretty bad. Now, take my prize frog, McDougal, for instance. He's had a sore throat for weeks. and Now, with this cold spell, I'm afraid he's developing sinus trouble. Oh, here's his cage right here. Hello, Mac. How do you feel? <clears throat> Gesundheit Have a Kleenex, Mac <coughs> You're welcome It's no wonder he's sick Look at the tank he's in No provisions for heating the water at all Or this morning his breakfast was frozen two inches from his nose By the time he did eat, he had indigestion <coughs> <laughs> That's really awful, Mr. Boynton This equipment is pretty obsolete What's this bowl here? Oh, these must be some new fish. What's the name of these pretty blue ones, Mr. Boynton? Goldfish. They're just cold. <laughs> they could slap their pins together. Oh, look at these cute little guinea pigs. Now, they're what I call sensible animals. Look how they huddle together for warmth in their cage. You know, Mr. Boynton, you and I could keep kind of warm that way, too. <laughs> oh, no, we couldn't, Miss Brooks. We could never fit into a cage that size. <laughs> But it would be fun trying to <laughs> Look, Mr. Boynton About what do you estimate it would cost For new equipment for this lab? Oh, a couple of hundred dollars, roughly One fifty if you smooth it out <laughs> That's a sort of a joke, Miss Brooks First I said roughly And then one fifty if you smooth it out Oh <laughs> That's a Lulu <laughs> Uh, I know another one, but I wish you'd stop me if you've heard it. It's about this group of people... I've heard it. You <laughs> have? Uh, the one about the group of people who are all discussing something in a very animated manner, and suddenly they stop, and this one fellow says, is anybody eating a lifesaver? And somebody else says, why? And the first chap says, because there's a hole in the conversation. <laughs> is that the one you've heard? No, I heard a different one. Tell yours. Well, it's about... <laughs> I just did tell it, Miss Brooks. Oh, so you did, Mr. Boynton. And a little beauty it was, too. But I'd better get ready for my first class now. I'll see Mr. Conklin at the beginning of lunch period. Well, it's awfully nice of you to do this, Miss Brooks. Will you have lunch with me afterwards? Oh, I'd love to, Mr. Boynton. Uh, and, Miss Brooks, 
please don't even bring your purse with you. It, it only embarrasses me when you try to pay your own check in the cafeteria. All right, Mr. Boynton. I'll leave my bag in my desk. Fine. When I see you to your room, I can pick up what you owe me. <laughs> That's a good one, too. <laughs> what am I laughing at? He's not kidding. <laughs> Let's see this list now. Weather stripping for my room, $50. Basketball team equipment, $100. New sewing machine, about $200. And biology lab equipment, $150. Total $500. Of course, that's without the additional coal we'll have to get. Well, here goes. Come in. Hello, Mr. Conklin. I just wanted Sit to Sit down speak... a moment, Miss Brooks. I'm speaking on the phone. Yes, sir. So you see, Miss Stanhope, this senseless extravagance has got to stop. Why, do you realize that your art class used up three more drawing pencils this month than last? <laughs> what do you think the school board is made of? Money? What? How can you cut down? Tell the students not to sharpen them so often. <laughs> and remember, Miss Stanhope, it isn't the 50 cents involved that's important. It's the money. <laughs> Get on the ball and let's start cutting down expenses around here. Good day. Now, what do you want? A uh, happy new year, Mr. Conklin. <laughs> I mean, I just happened to be passing your office, and I thought I'd stop in and say, hello. Hello. Now, if you'll excuse me, I was just going to lunch. But, Mr. Conklin, you don't want to go up to that drafty cafeteria. What do you mean, drafty? Oh, it is. It's almost as bad as the schoolrooms. What? And the gym and the biology laboratory and the domestic science room, in which your own daughter, Harriet, is at this very moment shivering and shaking while she sews her gloved fingers together on the sewing machine which Bessie Snyder broke. There, I said it, and I'm glad. If you're angling for another vacation, Miss Brooks, the answer is no. Now compose yourself and talk like a rational human being. Well, it's like this, Mr. Conklin. If we could get a larger appropriation from the school... A department... larger appropriation? <laughs> Miss Brooks, let me tell you what I was planning when you so fortuitously entered my office. I was planning on a general revision of expenses, an economy wave the likes of which this school has never seen. For example... You will in the future direct your pupils to use half as much chalk. You mean no more capital letters? <laughs> exactly. And this building, it's kept like a hothouse. I intend to cut way down on the supply of coal we're wasting. Wasting? But, but... Don't butt me, young woman. <laughs> oh, I can't help it. I'm the goat that was picked for the job. <laughs> that is, it's, it's not a question of a lot of money, Mr. Conklin. And the temperature of the school is very important. It certainly is. And I find it extremely comfortable for the most part. But uh, you, why are you wearing your overcoat? It's just a silly quirk of mine, Mr. Conklin. I'm trying to break up an ice jam in my arteries. <laughs> oh, nonsense. And take off those gloves. And I wish you'd stop smoking while you're talking to me. I'm not smoking. I'm just breathing. <laughs> well, cut it out. That's the trouble with people nowadays. They're all mollycoddles, softies. Why, when I think of our forefathers at Valley Forge, dragging cannons through the snow with their feet wrapped in rags, it's enough to make my blood boil. Well, it wouldn't boil in my room. <laughs> Look, Mr. Conklin, if you don't care about people, think of the poor little animals in Mr. Boynton's laboratory. What's wrong with them? The white mice can't run around on the treadmill without snowshoes. <laughs> and McDougal doesn't know whether to croak, sneeze, or hiccup. So he does all three, and it's pretty depressing. <laughs> well, then don't listen to it. And how about the basketball team? Walter Denton says that every time one of his substitutes goes into a game, he has to hide behind a trunk while they're changing blankets. <laughs> And just think, a hundred dollars would remedy the entire situation. A hundred dollars? Plus two hundred for a new sewing machine, fifty for weather stripping my room, and a hundred and fifty for warmer tanks and better equipment in the biology lab. Five hundred dollars is all you have to requisition from the board, plus some added money for coal. And if you'll sharpen the sword, I'll fall on it on my way out. <laughs> Miss Brooks, I'm going to try to control myself. I'm going to walk over to that window and look out of it. A moment later, I'm going to turn around, and you will have gone quietly out of the door. Ah, that's better. Five hundred dollars indeed. 
plus coal. Get out! <laughs> Brooks, the cafeteria was pretty crowded today. Young Denton here invited us to share his table. Sure, sit down, Miss Brooks. I want me to get you a tray? Thanks, Walter, but I haven't time to eat right now. I've just let, left Mr. Conklin's office, and he's flatly refused to requisition a penny from the school board. But the temperature, my animals, McDougal's toes are frostbitten now. And how about my basketball team? We got a very important home game on tomorrow night, and that gym is just icy. Oh, we got to do something, Miss Brooks. We just got to get some more coal into this building. Well, maybe we could start an airlift. <laughs> no, I guess not. Wait a minute. The only way to make Mr. Conklin see the necessity of improving the cold situation is to pretend we're all coming down with cold. You mean go into his office sneezing and coughing and all? Exactly. He won't dare face a school board investigation if he thinks an epidemic is starting. Besides, I happen to know he's quite a hypochondriac when it comes to contagious germs. But if we really don't have colds, it'd be lying to say we have, wouldn't it? It's a white lie for the common good, Mr. Barton. Oh, but you know what happens to me when I tell a falsehood. I have a psychosomatic symptom that causes me to hiccup. Well, we'll have to take that chance. <laughs> Think of McDougal, Mr. Boynton, and those blue goldfish swimming around depending on you to do something. I'll do it, Miss Brooks. I'll be darned if I don't. Oh, I beg your pardon. <laughs> oh, forget it, Mr. Boynton. In a crisis like this, even I resort to profanity. Oh, fudge. <laughs> In. Uh, Mr. Conklin, I got a bad cold. What? Uh, it's hit by Joe's and Ed, mostly. Sure. Yeah. Uh, turn around, Boynton. Don't you know those germs travel? How long have you had this cold? Oh, for a long time. And <laughs> shoo! <laughs> you caught something from that wretched frog of yours. Now go take some aspirin, go home early, do something, but get out of this office at once. Uh, but, Mr. Conklin, if my laboratory was a little bit wub, I'll talk to you after you've recovered, Boynton. Uh, fine, Mr. Yeah. Conklin. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, you. Better open the window and clear the air in this room. Ah, ah that's better. <laughs> Come in. It's me, Mr. Conklin. Water deaded. What do you want, Denton? As manager of the basketball team, I'd like to request a warmer jib. A what? A warmer jib to play in. It's freezing in there. I got a cold. You too? Well, cover your face when you sneeze. We got a very important game to play tomorrow, and we need some heat badly. Heat. Well, if you've got such a bad cold, Denton, you'd better not come around to the game tomorrow. What? I'll be there, and I'll appoint another manager. But I'm not that sick, Mr. Conklin. Gosh, I feel great. I mean... I think I know what you mean, Denton. This is all a scheme to get me to ask the board for more money. And I think I know who put you up to it, too. She did not. Oh, that is... <laughs> come in, Miss Brooks. How did you know it was B, Mr. Conklin? <laughs> I heard you rehearsing your sneeze. Gee, you look great, Miss Brooks. Never saw you looking better. Thank you, Walter. You couldn't possibly have a cold or anything the way you look. Know what I mean? Keep talking, Denton. I don't mind. Why, what's the matter with you, Walter? I have a terrible cold in my chest and my head. It's from my room, Mr. Coughlin. <laughs> uh, Mr. Coughlin, if that is the scream, you sure do a funny imitation of a person with a cold, Miss Brooks. What do you be, imitation? Sure. Everybody knows you're just fooling. <laughs> Among my own pupils, a stool pigeon. <laughs> I knew this was all a plot, Miss Brooks, and I'm ashamed of you. Why, just because there's a little fresh air circulating through the school. <laughs> Good fresh air. You throw a fit. Our forefathers should see you now. Those men at Valley Forge dragging the cannon through the snow with rags tied around their feet. Why oh, would I think of those? Oh. The door was open, so I just came on in, Daddy. Oh, uh, what is it, Harriet? I talked to Mother on the phone a little while ago, and her back's bothering her a bit. She'd like the heating pad. What heating pad? The one you've got under the cushion you're sitting on. <laughs> Here's the plug back here. Now, if you'll just get up a minute. There we are. I'll take it home to Mother right away. Where in the world did that thing come from? <laughs> from Valley Forge, of course. The boys... 
<laughs> the boys must have got some hot rags for their feet. <laughs> Well, Mr. Conklin recommended the necessary expenditures to the school board and personally ordered some coal immediately. I thought it was a very sportsmanlike and unselfish gesture, and I started to tell him so when I met him in the hall. Mr. Conklin, I think it was very nice of you to tackle this problem so promptly. Thanks, Miss Brooks. <laughs> but I wasn't prompt enough. I'm getting to bold you. Huh? Huh? Ah! the difference, Mr. Conklin, as long as you've got your health. 